lost track of the forest through the trees forgot what i was chasing spent so many nights living out at sea that my heart is gone vacant and everybody who was close to me all stayed on dry land so now i'm driving back on interstate west i just gotta feel something not gonna wait till the morning because something's gonna change my mind I don't wanna change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun that we're having here today, friends. We're gonna be talking about this Instax photo booth, as you saw that little demo intro in the beginning. Before we get going, there are gonna be timestamps down below. Hit them to jump around for what you need. This is going to be an overview tutorial. I'm gonna share with you how to do this setup with links to get similar products so that you can go all in or as budget conscious as you need. In that event, all of the links that you're gonna see are actually Amazon affiliate links. So if you pick something up, I will get a little bit of a kickback and I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you for supporting the channel. Finally, if you've got questions that aren't answered here, totally leave them down in the comments below. But if you're a DIY bride and you just need to chit chat with somebody, email me. I'll happily talk to you over the phone about how to do this. I won't charge you anything, especially if you use my Amazon links down below. So there we go. Let's jump right into it. All of that said, the first thing I wanna show you is light. And look at this. Look at this beautiful thing. And in just a second, we're gonna no light. Check that out. See, this is what you might actually see. This is what your camera sees. Your eye doesn't see this. Your camera sees this. And it's hard to actually tell what's going on here. This is what a low lit reception will look like. Your Fujifilm Instax mini film, your instant photography period requires so much light. It's amazing. Let's actually talk about how we build that light. We're going to build it in a couple of different ways first. One, two, three. So we already see a little bit of light coming in. We're gonna talk about all the settings, but I wanna show you how these things work in the first place. Now we've got this all set up. We've got our light coming in from the front. Don't forget, your set, your wedding, whatever you're using this, this is gonna be somewhere else, right? So this is going to be a draw. People will see it. It'll be a bright spot at your wedding. They'll enjoy coming to it. But we wanna use a little bit more light. We got this set up right now on this big backdrop, and you're gonna need a big backdrop. I'll talk to you about that in a second but we also wanna make sure that we're turning on the lights behind. I'm gonna break this entire photo booth down for you here in a second. So I want you to see how these things come together to create this really beautiful three-dimensional lighting. Okay. Now that that's out of the way, check this out. We've got a large area that's perfect for photographing someone specific, a group of people, whatever that we would like. We can talk about that a couple different ways when we're using our Instax mini camera. I'm gonna go over the gear in just a moment, but for those of you that wanna know up front, we need lights, we need a stand, we need backdrops, we need a camera, we need film. Those are your main things. A light stand or a uh, tripod is optional, an iPad is optional because it will allow you to control the camera. But uh, let's jump back into how we build the backdrop first because it's going to be the most important part of your photo booth. This backdrop, look how tall it is. It goes all the way up to the ceiling and that's required. You can do a smaller backdrop, but if you do a five by seven backdrop, you won't be able to get more than one or two people. In photography, if we're using a backdrop to do corporate headshots or things like that, we're going to do a, a what I call a three quarter possibly, but more a, a standard portrait with this, which is waist up to include the bust with a little bit of framing on the side on a five by seven. And we won't do two ups on a five by seven unless we turn it into landscape so it's wider than it is tall and then move it higher behind the shoulders of our two people that we're photographing at the same time. This is very important. This backdrop back here, I'm gonna to talk to you about it, but it's nine feet across. And nine feet across, if I'm standing right here shooting in a portrait orientation like you saw earlier, I can really only get one and two people to my side. Especially when I'm sitting down. If I'm standing up, I might be able to get a few more people in. But just imagine, if someone's way over here, do you want this in your photo? They're off your backdrop. You work all this hard time on this backdrop, you wanna keep it on the backdrop. Second thing is, uh, when we talk about the backdrop, we were talking about a vertically oriented photo, like a portrait, so we show feet to head, head to toe. But you could also turn it landscape and get a landscape style photo. We're gonna go over that in a minute. Let's actually look at how we build this. We've got one full sequence sheet in the back. It's tall enough to go from the top to the bottom. If this is actually a 12 foot by uh, 12 foot sheet, 
which is a, of sequins, which allows us to get exactly what we want. We've got a couple other pieces. We've got some drapery. Now, I didn't set it up, but you could totally put different types of uh, cover corners. You could put bows and stuff right here. You could decorate this however you want. This is just one of the ways that I do. Notice that we've got the background that we can see through. That's very important. We're going to talk about how we use that, but let's actually go ahead and lower this so that you can kind of see some things right now. As we're moving this down, you'll see that in a couple of ways, we're kind of being able to slant it. Now, when we build this, we actually put it together off of a pretty simple process. It's just a couple of beams that go across and then uh, two that go up. One goes across and two go up. Now, when you think about that, this backdrop stand, it's pretty important. Keep this up right about here. We want to make sure that as we're building this, right, we actually build it such that we don't screw our, our wing nuts down on our first cross member piece too much. If we do, then we won't be able to angle it when we put it up and down. That little angle right there won't happen because it'll be screwed in too tight. It'll just bend the bar where it attaches. Let's actually talk about this a little bit more. Now that we're here, we'll actually be able to pull the background off right there. And notice how you can see through, right? Let's talk, look at that. When I pull this down, we're actually able to hide quite a bit of room that we don't want people to see. And we can do that, especially with the lights from behind, because we have a scrim behind it. But without a scrim, we're going to be able to see what's behind. This will become very important for you to think about because depending on where you're gonna place your backdrop, you may need a scrim to go behind it. Here you can see that crossbar, which is right here, as well as the proper member that holds it up. This thing is pretty inexpensive. We'll talk about that in just a minute when we get into the gear. But you don't have to spend a lot of money on these. I've had this for 12 years, and I think I spent $30 on it. Now, the question of whether you get a white or a black scrim in the back is important, right? So if you want to kind of have some of that light show through and light from the back, get a white one. If you don't, get a black one. If you're trying to obscure completely something behind, get a black one. But if you're close to a wall, then there's nothing behind it that you're trying to obscure. You may not even need one with a dark enough background. In any event, when we build this, we build it in several sections. Of course, we put the uh, sequins, which is across the rod. We notice that this sequins happens to have a rod loop. So we can do that, a curtain rod loop. But if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because we could just as easily use clamps to hold it up. These will not be in your photos. So we go ahead and we put that on. And then the next thing we do is we bring up our scrim from behind. And as we do, now you can see exactly what the scrim is doing. Its job is working well. And we just kind of bunch it over like that. Now that that's done, we can kind of adjust this a little bit. We've got some other things that we're gonna do right here. We're gonna take this little side piece. This is important because this side drapery is going to be used to hide this upright that we've got right there. So we need to go ahead and place this on. Now this one is probably nine feet tall. So all I'm going to do is just kind of bring it up like that and pull it over the side. Now I'm gonna take this top piece, which I just draped in the center and you could put a bow or something else. In fact, you could even get a little neon print or a print and put the couple's name right there. It'd be pretty cool. I do that sometimes. And then we bring this and just drape over the top. Boom. And so now we've got, of course, two different sets of drapery. Putting this back up and hiding all the stuff that we don't want to see is pretty simple as well. And because we didn't screw down the wing nuts so much, we're able to actually do it in sections. By doing it in sections, one person can lift this up. Had this been screwed all the way down, the wing nut that was holding this uh, curtain rod on, then we wouldn't be able to do this. It would just be bending the, the, uh, the curtain rod. All right. Pretty simple. One more ought to do it. And we're gonna go all the way to the ceiling, okay? There's a lot of weight on these, so if you add too many curtains, you may need to put a little uh, heavy weight on the bottom, like a sandbag or something. But if not, then you'll be okay. We just adjust it to the very top. Now you see that it's adjusted. And what we're gonna do here, down at the scythe that we were talking about earlier, we're gonna make sure that our background, our bottom, goes all the way over and around the sides. And we pull our front drapery to the front of it. Now this is where it would be important if we were using some kind of uh, you know, bow or something, it could make this look a little bit nicer. Do it however that you wish. Okay, now that that's done, we can go ahead and bring our seating element in if you've got one. And voila, there we are, we're ready to photograph. Now you've seen how that's all set up. If you enjoyed that, 
I know you can't wait to move on to the camera. Camera's important, and we're gonna talk about angles for the camera. As you saw earlier, we were sitting down in this with a vertical or portrait-oriented photo. And we were photographing from a set location, basically small light stand or tripod with the camera on it. That's totally okay, right? And an easy way to operate the camera, especially if you're gonna use it more like a photo booth and allow the camera to be connected to an iPad and then people are working the iPad. The way that that works is pretty simple, but we're going to talk about it from a setting where you're not using any of that stuff. You're just using the camera. So from there, you're gonna to have to put your camera somewhere. And as you saw earlier, the camera setup was actually pretty low to the ground. And it had to be in order to get the right distance, the right composition, uh, especially using this really wide angle lens that's on the camera. Okay. Now, in this particular instance, we want to make sure that the camera is able to photograph straight onto the subject without any of the background spilling into the areas we don't want to see. We want the entire subjects on the background. In this instance, it was an orientation, something like this. The only way that you're going to know that is by actually attempting to figure that out and putting some little markers on the ground. For me, when I was working earlier, I found out that this was right here and I was able to photograph this setup just like this. However, if we change that setup to a standing setup, then we would need to move some things as well. In this instance, the camera would need to be much higher and we would need to orient the camera so that it got the entire background in the shot. Something along this lines is about where you would be. If we wanted to do something like a landscape style photo, of course we would need to move the camera into landscape orientation, but then we would have to be even higher, okay? Okay, and when we get this high, we need to do something. We need to angle the camera downwards a little bit, kind of like duck face. We gotta do that in order to make sure that we don't over-exaggerate the different head and forehead and leg pieces that are gonna be on the extremity of the shot. Wide angle lenses will often make the things at the edges of the frame expand quite a bit, which is why people like duck face like this because as photographing that way, it gets the head to look nice, but then it orients, makes the arms or the legs or whatever look real long. It makes things look slender. When we're doing portraits like this, it can just make you look weird. Anyways, once we get that all set up, those are our three angles and you'll have to adjust that as you do for yourself once you're photographing. Hey, check that out. We got it all said and done. There's a lot to talk about when we talk about gear, so let's actually jump right into it. We've got our Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo camera right here. This is gonna be your go-to, and this is what I'm suggesting that you use. If you have one, great. If you don't, this is a great wedding gift that someone could give you, or that you could pick up for your family, either which way. But there are other ways to do this, and you may already have them in your house. So before we talk about all the extra things, let's just finish up with the camera. The Fujifilm Instax Mini camera, Instax Mini Evo, really just does what the original Instax Mini printer does, which is just print digital photos. In fact, the printer will print off your phone just like the camera will. That functionality is built into most of the X-series cameras by Fujifilm over the past six years. This camera right here is a Fujifilm X-T2. It's got a battery grip on it, so it looks a little bit larger, but it doesn't have to be just like this, and it can work any way that you would like and you could even use it without the flash. And you have roughly a small camera, very similar to that one. You can find these for a couple hundred dollars, several hundred bucks, or you might already have one. But in any event, this camera will work and print directly to a printer, just like this one, straight from the camera. So if you would prefer to use a camera or one of your friends already has one, you can do that as well. It's already set up for you. Next thing is lights. When we talk about lights, we realize that these are really bright lights and they're really good lights, but they might be more expensive than what you might want to talk about with, well, your booth. You can pick up these lights. These are Wee Light, W-E-E-Y-L-I-T-E, Wee Light. -E 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 -E. We light. <laughs> 
as in, it's a wee little light or a small little light, right? And they're great. These little S05s, the square ones, as well as the K21, like this one right here, both work off of apps, which means that you can go ahead and turn these suckers on and then put them all over the place and control them with your phone, which is pretty cool. You can see they really light up even in here. In fact, you could light this entire thing with lights like this, specific to if you didn't have as much of a large backdrop in the background and you wanted a couple of these, these lights can be had for around 20 bucks. A couple of these little lights will give you some nice ambient lighting. Once again, these are by We Light. This is not sponsored. I'm just sharing with you how cool these little lights are. Now, as long as those lights are moving and going and having a good time, we need some stands. Well, the nice part about the We Lights is you could just tape them up wherever you want them to go. You just put a little double-sided tape, stick them on the wall, turn them on, you're good to go. They're gonna last for a couple of hours. You can plug them in and charge them off a USB if you need to. You can plug them into the wall and use them at the same time. This We Light K21 right here, which is even more bright and vibrant than the other ones, well, it will actually stick to something metal because it's got magnets in it, which makes a lot of sense too. So, if you have some light stands that you're gonna be using to hold up your backdrop, you can actually attach this to the back of your backdrop and create that lighting effect that you see right back there. Of course, these also change color, just like the other ones do. They work very well. The next thing we're gonna think about are backdrops, sequins. You don't need to spend a lot of money. All of these links are down below, just by the way, but you don't need to spend a lot of money. These things are like between five and seven dollars per panel, but here's a pro tip. Head on over to Joanne's Fabric. It's just that simple. You can go to Joanne's Fabric, get one of their coupons, or get half off when you buy more than a two yards or something like that. And next thing you know, you can have your own customized backdrop. You don't need to buy these. Now, if you get it from Joanne's, you're not gonna have that little sleeve that you can put the curtain rod through, and that's not a problem. Simply use the clamps like I showed you earlier. Easy peasy, right? The final thing is film. Film, you're gonna to have to have film. That cool film that we were looking at, you see it right now, all that stuff, that film is going to have to be purchased. Now, this, this film can cost a little bit of money. Generally speaking, Instax mini film can be had in the 100 pack or the 60 pack or whatever for about 53 to 72 cents per shot. You heard me right. Do not buy Instax mini film at the retail price of two packages, two packages of 10, for a total of $19.99. That's the price that you usually find in Best Buy. Don't do it. Okay, instead buy on the links that I've got down below because I've already searched and found the best bulk pricing for the Fujifilm Instax Mini Film for you on Amazon. And actually I created a chat GPT bot to help me find that so it alerts me and then I can update all the time whenever there's a better price. So you won't find a better price on film. Now, if you want some specialty colors, you can as well get that. The Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo will print in color or black and white with lots of different effects. In fact, we haven't even talked about all the cool stuff that the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo does. I've got seven or eight videos on that. Go check those out. But yeah, you do have some built-in effects to it. So there's no need to buy black and white film because the camera will turn whatever image you want black and white if you want it. Black and white film also costs more. Now, you can get specialty borders on your film. That costs quite a bit more. Generally speaking, 80 cents to a dollar and 10 cents per image, which means 11 to $15 per, per shot on the high end and eight to $12 on the low end. With an average, I think I can get them around 80 cents, 90 cents a shot, eight to $9 per pack of 10. Keep that in mind as you think about these things. The next thing that we're gonna talk about is when we've got our camera decided upon, what settings should our lighting be? Well, the reality is we're going to be on auto on the camera. And if we're moving the camera around a lot, because the camera only has an automatic mode. If your guests don't understand how the camera works, if they're not photographers, which many of them may not be, most of them won't be, then you're gonna to wanna to leave it on auto. But if you've got it in a setup spot, like we were showing earlier, where someone will simply press the photo button, the shutter button, and then go sit down, or if someone's going to operate it for you that way, well, then you can dial in your settings quite a bit better. For me, since we're using lights like this, I put the flash on forced flash, which means it will always fire, and I put it on the sunny setting, the one that looks like the sun. That tells the camera to use a flash that's used to or somewhere around daylight balance, which is uh, 5600, 5800 Kelvin. That's important, because your colors need to look right or else everybody will look off. The lights that we've got 
here are also set to be 5600 Kelvin. Boom, here. By setting the flash to 5600 Kelvin or the sunny setting and setting our main lights to the proper setting as well, they match, then that means that the camera won't accidentally choose some other color. And because we've got light coming from the ceiling and bouncing off here, we've got all these different light sources that are gonna be around, the camera could choose uh, a different color. This is called a mixed lighting setting. So by telling the camera what setting to be on based off our main lights, it will always use a flash that is synchronized with our main lights for color. Once we've got all this set up like this, the next question is, how do you print the images? Well, printing is done directly on the camera or through an app. When you print your images, you can do a little bit of photo correcting on camera or on the app. And they come out like this. We're gonna run something so that you can see that now. That's gonna bring us to pricing, okay? And let's see how many films you actually need. So when we think about the film, figure that you're gonna want probably 100 shots per 30 people, assuming a mix of uh, kids and adults in there, a regular mix. So if you've got 100 people at your wedding, you'll probably need about 300 images or film, which would mean 30 packs. Could you get through with less? Sure, but if you buy the film as cheaply as possible, which is about 50 to 60 uh, cents per shot, you're going to get that at roughly 150 bucks. Just getting the backdrop alone from Joann's, the cheapest that you might be able to get it for whatever backdrop that you could choose, you're probably gonna be about $25. You can buy your own textured backdrops for that price, but at Joann's, at least you know you're going to get the width and the length that you want. Remember, you want floor to ceiling, you want 12 feet, eight feet plus a few on the bottom, and you want at least 10 or 12 feet wide. That's so that you can bunch up the backdrop so that it ruffles. So you're probably at $25 to $30 there if you use a coupon. Uh, by the time we talk about lighting, you're gonna need some lights. Now, you don't have to use all of these specialty lights that I've shown, but if you do use them, uh, you're probably going to be, you're gonna need at least three lights, $20 each at 60 bucks. And you can see that just at that point right there, before you can get into the camera, camera's gonna be another $200. Generally speaking, to buy into something like this, to do it for yourself, would be a great way to get the camera for your family, right? and have memories for family and friends, okay? This would be like a present to yourself or someone gifted you this present ahead of time. This is gonna be around 400 bucks to do it this way. Now, if you already have your camera, you're closer to $200, which is a good deal. Uh, maybe 250, depending on how you stretch your materials and do your, do your makeup. Of course, you could make all of this through using just the, well, props and things you would get from Walmart or even the Dollar Tree. And although that could be a good option for some decorations from time to time, you really don't want to skimp as much as you might think on your backdrop because it just isn't gonna look nice in your photos. And that's really what you're, we're looking for. That means trying to do this properly as a DIY bride means you're gonna be spending comparable to what I would charge as an add-on if you already purchased my service. For example, if you purchased my boutique wedding package or my signature wedding package, right, which does not come with a photo booth and wanted to add one on, my pricing would be 350, right? Uh, because you were already purchasing a photo booth. My regular pricing for a photo booth, any member of my team or two members to come and run a photo booth for someone is $700. So if you were just buying the photo booth service from me and someone else was providing other stuff, then it would cost more. Many photographers are going to offer bundles like that for you if you just ask them about their services. If you don't, you may not know. So trying to do it yourself is really going to be a choice you have to make. Where I see it being the biggest benefit is if you would like a camera like the Fujifilm Instax Mini Evo, or maybe you already have a Fujifilm camera, an X-Series camera, and you want to add a photo printer, one of the Instax printers to it, that makes it a lot easier because then you're gonna have something that's got more use than just one time, right? All right, there you have it. There's not really a lot more to know about your photo booth. It's all ready to go. Everything from your backdrop to your stand, to your lights, to the camera and film are all done for you. What if you don't wanna use the film? What if you'd just like to send your images to Twitter or Twitch or something like that? 
then you can easily supplement out the camera with an iPad stand. One thing I would suggest be very careful of, the ring lights for the iPad stands. If you use one of those, that can help, but what it can also do is make sure that nothing else is lit up appropriately. You're going to need lights, three-dimensional lighting from all the way around in order to get the best possible image. That being said, I hope that you have found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. Please use my Amazon links down below. And let me know that you found this helpful and send any questions that you have to me in my email over on the website or down in the comments below. I'm Rob, I wanna thank you for watching and remind you that I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye for now.